Bingo. Community matters. But you knew that. <laughs> you also knew that our Community Matters Today show is about, is about uh, Sean Hamamoto and the Neighborhood Commission and the Neighborhood Boards. In fact, he is the executive director of the Honolulu Neighborhood Commission office. And he comes to us today to talk about what's going on in the Neighborhood Commission and the Neighborhood Boards. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you for having me again, James. So happy to be here. It's great to see you again. We like to have you come on and talk about it. So um, in February, uh, you called for, well, leading up to February, mm -hmm. you called for the registration of candidates yes. for the current elections, the oncoming elections of members of neighborhood boards. Uh, can you tell us how that worked and how it went? Thank you, Jay. Uh, yes, you know, um, just to give a little preface to this story, um, going into this candidate registration um, period, we were actually very worried, and here's why. Uh, I think most people recall in our last general election last fall, um, I believe it was one of the worst voter turnouts in Hawaii history. Um, Hawaii historically has had low voter turnout. So coming off the tails well, of that. Let me say that's quite remarkable because you know, this was a big midterm election federally. Yes. And I, I find it extraordinary that people would not vote in a mm -hmm. history making federal midterm election. Yeah. You know, it, it is a mission and it's a cause for concern. And so coming into this candidate registration, our office we were really worried that gosh, maybe our numbers are gonna be low, people aren't gonna come out. So we did put a concerted effort into getting out there, um, public outreach efforts. And um, I can tell you, at the end of the day, um, we resulted in 533 candidates signed up, and that happened to be the second highest amount of candidates ever in neighborhood board history. Mm. So we were very thrilled with that. And I think the takeaway from that is, is um, although perhaps the general public's maybe not so interested in these general elections, the grassroots democracy is alive and well. And I think that's yeah. the good news. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So what was the secret sauce? How did you do that, Sean? You know, I'm gonna, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I can say um, for our office, the Neighborhood Commission office, we did put a concerted effort into going out into the community for the first time ever, to my knowledge at least, we actually held um, candidate registration drives at, you know, we'd go to shopping malls all over the island just trying to, try to sign up people. That's grassroots. Yes. So uh, I think it's a combination of that. And I just think there are issues um, around our island that do have people concerned. And um, a lot of the people we did talk to, that was the reason for getting involved. They were not happy with what was going on in their community. And they saw this as a platform to get involved. So um, at the end of it, while we were concerned at first, we were very happy with the results of the candidate registration. So what, what was the pitch? You, I'm really curious, because this is a phenomenon you're talking about, and, and a good one. Um, what's the pitch you make to people at a mall or an event where you, you're trying to get them interested? You say, got a problem? Are you unhappy about something in your, in your neighborhood? Uh, or as, as city or state government affects your neighborhood? Come on down, you have a voice. Is that kind of pitch or what? Well, I, usually one of the first questions we ask people is uh, straight up, have you ever heard of the neighborhood board system? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> and surprisingly, even to this day, there are some people who've never heard of it, which is surprising uh, since this system's been around since the early 70s, since Mayor Fossey. So that's usually the first question we ask. And if the answer is no, we tell them what it's about. Mm -hmm. But once they find out what the board's about, almost everybody we talk to has a concern. Oh, you know, we're having some issues with um, this uh, off-street parking here. Oh, um, our parks are being vandalized. Someone's always got an issue. So we let them know that, hey, this is a great venue for you to voice your concerns and to meet with your elected officials face-to-face -face and talk with them and as a community uh, discuss solutions to these issues. That's great that you can stir up the interest. I wonder if the uh, state or federal government could stir up the interest on, on voting in general <laughs> on uh, Election great. Day. You know, you, they, they, could, they could learn learn from you. <laughs> I'd be happy to help. Actually, we just met with the uh, U.S. Census Bureau um, last week, and we're going to be helping them because they're wanting to get out to get people to participate. As you know, um, the amount of people participating in our census relates to the federal dollars we get. And so they came to actually reach out to us asking, hey, can you help us get out the word? So by all means, uh, in my mind, we have the same goal, which is public participation. So uh, by all means, we're going to be assisting uh, the U.S. Census Office in their efforts for the 2020 census. Good, good. Because mm -hmm. we all need the census to be accurate. Absolutely. We, we should all help the census. 
and we should not uh, interpose citizenship questions on the census so as to scare people away. I hope that gets work, worked out soon. Um, anyway, so 500 people, uh, they're all ostensibly running for seats yes. on how many neighborhood boards? Uh, so we have 33 neighborhood boards across our great county, um, about 436 uh, volunteer board members. So uh, when you talk about a grassroots effort, you think about 400 plus community people. I mean, I think that's a, something to be proud of. So it's not mm -hmm. all unopposed. Some of them are Some running are, for contested seats. Yes, yeah, so it, it's a mixed bag depending on the area. Some of them are unopposed. Um, we do have some contested races, so yeah, it'll be interesting. So is everybody on there, is this, is this a fresh slate? Or are there people who are grandfathered in for a term? No, everybody, all seats are open. Mm. So even if you've been on the, the board for 20 years, you still have to run. I like that. I like that, too. Uh, and is mm -hmm. there a term limit or anything? Um, there's no term limits. Um, that issue has been brought up in the past. Um, the reason why people were against it, uh, well, some of the arguments is the fact that unlike public officials, <laughs> these um, neighborhood board, board members aren't paid. Um, they really um, are advisory, so they don't have the power to make laws. And just for the fact, it's, it is rather difficult to get people to participate. You know, you're asking someone for a two-year commitment, at least, you know, one night a month. Um, so the feeling is, well, if somebody wants to volunteer, you know, we should let them. Yeah, one thing mm -hmm. strikes me, though, and I, I offer you a suggestion on sure. this. Although I certainly t agree that, you know, we need to encourage people to run and be on these boards and you know, actively engage on these boards, there probably should be a term limit on the chair of the board. Because mm. some of these boards have chairs that, who have been there forever, mm -hmm. and it tends to calcify when that happens. Do you agree? Um, I would say yes and no. You know, I would say it depends on the board. You know, I'm a firm believer in democracy. Now, as we know, the chairs are elected by the board. So if the board feels that that's the chair, you know, ruled by the people, then so be it. But, you know, to be very honest, we have seen um, a turnover, a sort of a changing over of the guard. Um, many longtime chairs who have been around, you know, for years are no longer with the system. Um, so that's, so that's a good thing. I, I think that's a good trend. So. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, there's this potential for the neighborhood board um, to really mm, um, activate people in terms mm -hmm. of their relationship with government, Definitely. all government. It starts grass, grassroots, as you say. Mm -hmm. So what, what role um, does the commission play in managing uh, this election and in mm -hmm. managing the neighborhood boards? So for this election, yes, um, we are um, administrating this entire election. So that's um, everything going on behind the scenes. You know, as you know, this is an online election. So behind the scenes, we're working with the Office of Elections, our Department of Information Technology to make sure our uh, computer infrastructure is all set. And um, it's basically that, getting out into the community, um, going on shows like such as yours to get the word out, to get people to participate. We're happy to, to help you do that, Sean. Thank you so much. And then uh, in terms of just the day-to-day the -day running of the board, yes, our staff are the ones that help boards, um, assist the chairs in publishing their agendas. Um, our staff is the one that takes the minutes, which is the minutes that go on the public record forever. Um, and just helping the boards with any administrative concerns they may have on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, yeah, and, and um, you're, uh, are you the organization that says to the police, come on down? Are you the organization that mm -hmm. says to the fire department, come on down? Uh, or the mayor's representative, or to the water, water supply, come on down. <laughs> you know, it's actually up to the chair. Um, according to the neighborhood plan, it is the chair who's responsible for um, producing the end agenda. And we like to have it like that. You know, uh, one of, I guess, on a philosophical tangent, you know, I really believe that we should give these boards as much autonomy as possible um, because every community is unique. Um, so that's one of the ways these boards are very autonomous is that the board can create their own agenda. So it's up to them. But I would say, by and large, most boards, you know, like, you know, HPD or the fire department to come because of the public safety updates mm -hmm. that they have. I'd like the Board of Water Supply to come down to ours because I have a few remarks I would like to make to them about the flood in Nuuanu. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the neighborhood board's a perfect place to um, talk about these yeah. things. So um, the other thing is... Um, um, how much power, I, autonomy is good. And I mean, we talked before about 
uh, the neighborhood boards had the aut autonomy to decide whether to film and televise their proceedings on Olelo, which is not expensive because all you got to do is pay the cameraman, right? Yes. Olelo will broadcast it free. Um, but, but they have the power to do it or not do it. What are the pros and cons of that? And how are the boards reacting to that? And, and um, you know, what, what do you see in the future for television televising these board meetings? Mm -hmm. I definitely think this is just the beginning as technology, um, in, in my mind, as technology becomes more sophisticated, I really do see us live streaming these meetings. Currently, they are recorded and played back a few weeks later. I know a few boards have started experimenting with live streaming. I think in the future, we're going to move more towards that where people from the comfort of their own home or smart device can watch a neighborhood board meeting from home or at a restaurant, at the library, something. Uh, so I yeah, do well, see it getting really a better. good idea, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, I can tell you, I'm a for, former board member myself. Um, I was a former member of the downtown Chinatown Neighborhood Board. And at that time, this was back in 2011, for all those years, they have always been resistant to being televised for some reason or another. But it was my goal. I thought if there's one thing I can do with my time on this board is I need to get this board televised. Uh, why um, back then the meetings were held on Pauahi Street with um, very little or no street parking. Um, and I was concerned about our elderly or perhaps disabled people who would have problems getting to that. And because of the issues in Chinatown, I thought it was only fair. And because it is a people's board that the people should be made aware. And it's very difficult if in order to become aware, you have to be able to physically be present at this meeting. So I thought by having it on Olelo and recorded, people you know, at their own convenience, they can go online and, and see what happened. So I, I, there was a bit of resistance at first, but finally, you know, I convinced the board, hey, can we give it a try? And they agreed, and so far so good. Up until now, now we're in 2019, and they're still being uh, recorded, so I'm very happy about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I just to add a thought to that, is that I, I would favor, I do favor, um, you know, recording and, for that matter, streaming. Why? Because I think that... Um, Although, you know, it's hard to get people to serve on boards, somehow this makes it easier. It makes them see themselves as, as public officials. They are public. Yes. They're officials. They're and what they do and say, how they appear, how they conduct themselves, it's all for the benefit, arguably, of, of the public. You know, and what, what I hate to see in a given um, a neighborhood board meeting is, is some person says, um, I'm, I'm sitting on this board and I want you to fix the front of my house. There's cracks in my sidewalk. There's homeless sleeping in my mm -hmm. lawn and I want you to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's self-interested. Mm -hmm. That's not raising to the level of a public official concerned with the whole neighborhood and Correct. all the neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I think if you put them on the air, they're, they're going to figure it out. <laughs> they're uh, public officials. I, I agree. And, and I think it helps the community know how the people the elected are representing them. And again, uh, one of our major tenets of our board system is transparency. You know, we ad adhere very strictly to the state sunshine law. So I think having these meetings recorded, it just furthers our goal of transparency with public meetings. Yeah. Well, I love the idea, although it's, it's probably a way to go of, of streaming these meetings yeah, We're not live. quite there yet, but I, I honestly believe we will. In a few years, we will get we, there. We do this. We, you can ask me how to do it. I'll tell <laughs> okay. you how to do it. We've been through all of the learning experience on that, yeah. So we're Sean Hamamoto, uh, the executive director of the uh, neighborhood, uh, Honolulu Neighborhood Board Office. Uh, neighbor, excuse me, Honolulu Neighborhood Commission Office. Um, we're going to take a short break, Sean. We'll be right back after this. And then we're going to talk about the election itself coming soon. This is the real purpose of our meeting today. Sounds great. The election Thank you. itself. Be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii 
We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Yeah, the magic word is uh, Sean Hamamoto. That's the magic word today. <laughs> He's the executive director of the Honolulu uh, Neighborhood Commission Office, which runs the neighborhood boards. I should say, which provides administrative support for the neighborhood boards because yes. they run themselves. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have your 500 and some odd candidates ready yes. to fill your 400 and some odd seats on 33 neighborhood boards. See how much I remember. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay. And this election is going to take place over about a month or so. Well, tell us about the time frame. Yes. So the actual voting period starts this Friday, April 26th, and runs until Friday, May 17th. Um, passcodes, I just want to remind people out there that this is primarily an online election. Um, about 10 years ago, the Neighborhood Commission did decide to make uh, elections primar primarily online to utilize technology. Um, I just do want to add, though, that for those who perhaps do not have access to a computer or are not quite comfortable using a computer yet, we do have a mail-in ballot option. You know, we really don't want to disenfranchise anybody as much as we want to encourage um, people. Mm -hmm. So please um, call us and we would be happy to send you a, a paper ballot. Um, but uh, passcodes have actually throughout this week will be mailed out to all registered voters. Um, it's going to come in a simple white envelope and it's going to be a passcode. It's a unique passcode, so what you just go to our website and you enter your passcode and literally you can vote in about two minutes. It's really fast Most and people secure. must vote online, it's so easy. Uh, I would say about, um, in our last election, about 90%, over 90% did okay. online. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't have to speak Russian or anything like that to vote online, eh? No, no, it's, um, it is in English. I'm joking, yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> we like to think of global issues. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I can vote, I can vote online. I can ask for a paper ballot. What what telephone do I telephone number do I call? Seven six eight three seven one zero. Seven six eight three seven three seven one zero. And in addition, we've also um, made a deal uh, or a partnership with our Hawaii State Library system. So for people who don't have computers at home, you can go to any state library that has you know computers, and that can also be a voting station. Oh, cool. And we're also setting up voting stations, um, Kapola Mahale. Uh, Kapolei Hale and the key project out um, Kahulu. So there, there are a lot of ways that people can get out there and vote. We want to make it as easy as possible for people. So um, yeah, and, and, and certainly that's important. How, how many voters do you hope to achieve? I mean, and mm -hmm. are you doing the same kind of um, you know, voter registration mm -hmm. effort that you did with getting candidates? Uh, you know, in, in terms of the effort, definitely, you know, um, we're going out in the community as much as possible. I believe this week uh, we're going to be out, out in a couple of neighborhoods around the island. Um, in, in terms of voter participation, you know, that is a goal of mine to try to get as many people as possible. I can tell you in our last election, we had a little over 20,000 voters. And at that time, that was the highest number of voters for our online election. So that was the good news. Um, the other part of it is, and I think just from a historical standpoint, is that the elections went online in 20, 2009. Prior to that, though, that year, in looking at my records, um, I wasn't here at the time, but prior to that election in 2007, they had a high of 40,000. So from 40,000 uh, in 2007, in 2009, it went online, and we saw a drastic drop. From 40,000 votes, it went down to 10. And uh, ostensibly, it's because people are not quite used to you know, the online system. Mm. It takes people. But what I've seen in looking at the numbers over the past uh, decade now is, is a steady increase. Um, so hopefully one day we can get back up to those numbers of 40,000. Um, but I can say my goal this year is to get more than last time. And we had 20,000, a little over 20,000. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, that's still a lot of people. 20,000 mm -hmm. people is a lot of people out there just taking the time to vote. Mm -hmm. It must be. I mean, I'm sure there are various factors in mm -hmm. those numbers. but. One of them has to be that 
If you have a lot of people voting, it means they have a lot of concerns about the way the city is working. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, I mean, one element here, maybe the number of people who are concerned and complaining about how the city is working are less now. That could also explain the drop. Mm -hmm. I'm making that up. I don't know. But um, it, just, it must be a number of factors that lead mm -hmm. to that demographic change. Yeah, I, I, I personally think it's just the fact that they pretty much back in 09 went cold turkey to that online system. And that's where you saw that drastic, a 75% drop. Right away. So that's, um, a good, that's a good correlation right there. I, I think it is. Yeah, but okay. like I said, the good news is, is every year it's been, you know, so 2009, 10,000 volts. Uh, here we are just several years later. We, we doubled that. We're up to 20,000. So I think Pretty we're good. on the right path. Pretty good. We're going to keep at it. That's though. A How long have you been in this job? Um, so this year I was first appointed to this position by Mayor Caldwell in 2015. So this August is going to make four years. Okay. Good. Good for you mm -hmm. for having your eye on the ball. So um, what about the candidates? Mm -hmm. You know, if I went through the trouble of putting my name in and all that, um, now I'm a candidate. The election's going to start mm, pretty soon. Pretty soon. Uh, what should I do? Should I get out there and pound the pavement, knock on doors, as they do for state legislature? I mean, how do I, how do I get votes? Well, for those in contested races, um, you know, we actually we leave it up to the candidate. We say, you know, you can do however you want it. On one end of the spectrum, you have people who will simply just put their name on the ballot. That's it. On the other end of the spectrum, you do have people who will go door to door, which I actually think is a better idea if you're going to serve your community, go door to door to their neighbors, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm running for your, your neighborhood board. Uh, we have some people um, posting flyers. Uh, this one candidate I know, he lives in a condo building, so he's passing out flyers to his neighbors. But, you know, it's open. You know, it's, it's whatever well, you, if want you really to make want it. it. If you really want it, you should you go out and get make it. Make some effort, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also, I'm very curious on this, you know, this, as we talked about, a lot of people stay on the board year after year. Mm -hmm. So this is like, you know, this is like the freshmen in Congress. How many freshmen are out there? In other words, candidates who have never sat on the board versus uh, people who've been sitting on the board in the past. You know, that is a very interesting um, question. And I would love to come back to you after the elections with the results. And I can tell you specifically. Uh, I would love to have okay, that information. Okay, that's a date. I want to hear about that. that, that you know, that mm -hmm. change tells us mm -hmm. a lot about the community. And, and I actually have seen that in, in some of our communities, especially here in the urban core. Uh, we've been seeing some of the millennial generation get involved, uh, new chairs coming up. So, you know, it's a work in progress, but, you know, I'd be very happy to report that. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, I want to see what that means, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is... Uh, we're not necessarily talking about vacancies that are filled midterm. In other words, um, uh, suppose uh, we have a whole new slate, mm -hmm. boys are, you know, seated and say, I don't know, June, July this year, whenever it is, mm -hmm. um, and then somebody resigns, uh, you know, falls off somehow. Now there's a vacancy. Yes. My recollection is that the sitting members of the board then fill the vacancy by their vote. Am I right about that? Correct. Right. Um, how, how often does that happen? You know, that happens, I would say, quite often, um, just for the fact that, yes, it, it is a two-year term. And um, people resign for many reasons. I would say a common reason that people resign is simply that they move out of the area. Um, you're not pursuant to the neighborhood plan. You're not allowed to be a representative if you don't live in the district. Oh, yeah. So if people move out of the area, they need to resign. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, family obligations, so forth. But for whatever reason, sometimes people are not able to complete their term, which is fine. And yes, you are correct. It is up to the board to fill those uh, vacancies. And usually how it's done is you'll have uh, somebody, they'll get someone from the audience. You know, the vacancy will be listed on the agenda. So when they get to that point is mm -hmm. anyone in the audience want to serve? And they usually are able to get. But there could be a contention, too. There could be more and, than and one that, wants to serve. And it could be more than one. <coughs> and then. Mm -hmm. Uh, the chair would have them present, exactly. <clears throat> and the board would decide which one it liked best. Mm -hmm. So again, a democratic process. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I also wanted to ask you um, what, what, what their authority is these days. You know, my recollection is the board didn't have any legal authority, but mm -hmm. they had a kind of moral authority. And for example, if a, if a, uh, a government agency wasn't doing a job, in their view, they could write a letter. 
And if that didn't solve the problem, they could write another letter, and they could write higher up, and they could get other officials involved um, until there was enough, what do you want to call it, political pressure mm -hmm. on that agency to at least respond to them and take action. Mm -hmm. um, does it go beyond that? Well, um, I'll put it this way. So you're correct. Um, the board members don't any have um, some, they don't have any authorization powers. Um, they are, um, at essence, an advisory board. But what I can tell you is that they do can have an effect on how government conducts their business. Um, if you look at, just say, um, developments, if you look at our land use ordinance, um, certain developments are required by the law to make a presentation to the neighborhood board. Um, liquor licenses, that's another big one. Uh, certain communities have a lot of liquor establishments. Um, so it is written in the Liquor Commission rules that you know, new applicants must go before the board. So what that shows me is that the government does take what the board says seriously. Otherwise, they wouldn't make it mandatory for them to present to the community. Um, another good one, uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, with park closures, uh, before they take any action on closing a park, uh, you know, perhaps to stem illicit activity, is they require that the issue be brought before the neighborhood board and the board take a position on it before they'll even move on it. So although they don't have the authority, I say they give some really strong advice, is a good yeah. way to put it. And the government, yeah. um, in a lot of cases, they do listen. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting role. I mean, two things, um, two things that I learned when I served on a neighborhood board is that sometimes the board members forget uh, their middle name, neighbor, the word neighbor. <laughs> And they're, you know, way lofty, uh, dealing with issues that have nothing to do with um, their neighbors uh, and, and, and making love among their neighbors, you know. Mm -hmm. The other is that um, it's easy to fall into the notion, and some boards do this more than others, that you're, you're, you're a big cheese now, and you can mm -hmm. be very lofty and officious. And that doesn't help in sure. terms of dealing with the neighborhood. So, sure. you know, it's a matter of achieving the right tone. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Do you address them? Do you talk to them? Do you give them guidelines? Well, we do provide training, um, a general training. And, you know, we do point out, as stated in the neighborhood plan, rules on um, decorum. Um, however, you know, and, you know, I'm going to be fair. I, I, you know, nobody means ill. And I just think sometimes people are passionate because it's their neighborhoods. But what I do have is I have my staff, and they're the key, our neighborhood assistants, who actually sit at the board meetings and assist the board chairs. They are actually a big part in helping keep the decorum. Um, so I can just tell you what goes on behind the scenes is that sometimes when well, we do have issues where maybe somebody's um, maybe using vulgar language or people are getting a little feel oh, threatened. Yeah. That's we'll, a really good point. We'll, we'll take care of it. On this, you know, we'll counsel you them on the side. You can't tolerate that. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, we'll call in a chair to counsel them. So we help. The, and ultimately, it is the chair's responsibility to run the meeting, but we're there to assist the chair. Yeah. Um, it does, it does require management. It does require mm -hmm. administration. I mean, the point you raised earlier about um, a member of the neighborhood board, one of the people who would win here in this coming election, could move out of the neighborhood and not say boo about it. But mm -hmm. theoretically, that person is disqualified from serving on that board. Mm -hmm. He needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to make that point mm -hmm. and ask him nicely to leave or her to leave. And we actually <laughs> did have that uh, recently at one of our boards. Yeah. It does come up. Last question, Sean. Mm -hmm. Every board gets a, a budget of sorts from the city. Um, I don't remember what it was, and I certainly don't know if it's changed, but I wonder if you could talk about that for a minute. Okay, yeah, I don't have the exact figures, but I can tell you it is a um, shoestring budget. Basically, um, the boards are allotted a budget, and uh, we pay for their monthly facility use. Um, so that could be like a school cafeteria, cafeteria or, yeah. a community center, whatever the case may be. Yeah. So, But the funds are used to basically pay for their facility use, um, any printing, you know, we send out agendas to the area. Yeah. Uh, we also provide if they want banners um, to advertise. I mean, just, in the meeting. Yeah, yeah um, or actually like uh, certain boards, they'll have a banner and they'll place that out somewhere in the community during that week. Hey, come to our neighborhood board. I think we just gave kind oh, of a key one. Oh, publicize the meeting, yeah. I think New Owana had one for yeah, a few yeah, years. Yeah, we were, yeah, okay, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, just, you know, just very simple um, operations, but that's basically what the money goes for. And um, for any newsletters or um, Olelo, um, well actually, Olelo broadcast for free, but uh, we help pay for the um, recording camera, services. The camera, yes. yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, last, last question. I, mm -hmm. I said the last one was 11. I'll add you one more. Um, how is it doing in a sort of trajectory sense? Where do you see this system going? You know, from mm -hmm. it's been up and down over mm -hmm. the years. Uh, sometimes it's been very effective. And that's, I guess that's the, the condition of humanity. Um, where do you see it going from here? I'm very hopeful. Um, and of course, you know, I'm coterminous uh, with the mayor. So as much as I love this job, I'm only here till the end of his term. Um, all I can say is that I hope that the foundation that in this admission that we sent will help propel the neighborhood system into the future. And I just hope, wish them the best. But I do have hope that with technology is going to be a game changer. I really think that that's going to be a key ingredient in really getting uh, more community input and more community involvement. Yeah, community engagement. That's, that's mm -hmm. what we care about most and happy to see any infrastructure that, that enhances that. Thank you so much, Sean Hamamoto, Neighborhood Commission. Aloha. Thank you.